All right, let's go ahead and get going. Uh, this is unit two called Research and Statistics. The name of the unit is going to be on Schoology in that new folder. Uh, we'll have five different lessons for this unit, so much bigger unit. Probably one of the largest for the whole AP test. Uh, we're looking at anywhere from 10 to 14 questions on the AP exam in this May. And um, it'll take us a good three weeks to get through this. We're about a day behind uh, because of my absences. Sorry about that. Just got to take care of business at home, uh, as you guys will know. Uh, so first lesson, remember when we do uh, notebook checks, you have to have the exact same title as it is up there. And anything you miss, um, just go back and take care of it. This should take us about 15, 20 minutes. Lesson one, descriptive research. So if we kind of break down the science to psychology, we kind of talked about the approaches and the growth already. Um, now we're looking at research methods and statistics. So this is the section that we're going to be looking at. All right, all right. If you are, from, you don't have to write this down. If you're familiar with the scientific method that you've done in class, your bios, your chems, your anatomy, uh, you are going to have fairly easy job on how to work on this. Um, today we're going to be talking about these three, naturalistic observation, survey, and case study, and how we form a hypothesis, how we create uh, testable operational definitions, what are correlations, what are experiments, and all of that. Okay, so these are the three types of descriptive research we will go over. All right, first is called naturalistic observation. Natural, naturalistic observation in its most basic form would be like any of those documentaries that you see on TV about animals. You know, uh, BBC Earth does a lot of these where we are watching animal behavior perfectly in their environment without disturbing it as much as possible. It's almost impossible to do a perfect study of human behavior unless humans do not know they're being filmed or watched, which is unethical. We'll talk about the ethics of research as well down the road. But systematic study of animal or human behavior in natural settings rather than a lab. It is more natural to get natural human responses as opposed to a lab where people know they're being watched. Uh, so it's going to be very, very difficult to get a perfect naturalistic observation without some sort of variables, confounding variables that we'll talk about. So what is the strength of a naturalistic observation? Behavior is more natural than if we, if they were in a lab. So the reason why animal studies are so important when it comes in regards to projecting that into the psychology of humans is that we can analyze certain animals that are closely related to us in a lot of cognitive abilities. Obviously, bonobos, uh, which is, you know, from the chimps and the apes, the, the monkeys, all those animals that are closely related to our genome are going to be highly beneficial to us. We've talked about rats before, like why are rats used so much? Well, rats are survivors. Rats know how to find a way and find an answer, especially when it comes to survival methods. What about pigs? Well, pigs are typically used in a lot of medical research, not as much in a psychological research. So that could help as well. The problems that we have with nat naturalistic observations, we cannot replicate those exact moments. We cannot generalize as well, meaning that if a naturalistic observation is done on teenagers from Topeka, Kansas, we can make a generalization about teenagers in general, which would be dangerous because teenagers from Topeka, Kansas live a different life than teenagers from San Diego and teenagers from Miami, Florida to Indianapolis. And then you break it down in a lot of different differences. And then also you have observer bias. It does not matter what we are doing. Psychologically, we are always going to have a bias. And it's something that's really, really hard not to... Um, it's really hard to, uh, to avoid. You know, we judge people by stereotypes. We judge people how they look, how they sound, how they smell. Um, it makes it really, really difficult. So we got a naturalistic observation, you know, the classic CYO dance. Um, and then you also have Jane Goodall over there on the left. 
the naturalistic observation elements that we kind of get into when we see moments like this are about teenage angst and worry and um, wonderment as well. What about a case study? A case study is a super unique study of a single individual or just a few individuals. We looked at the Kathy O case last week about the girl who left her 10,000 meter race at the NCAA championships, hopped the fence, ran to the New York Street Bridge right here in Indianapolis and jumped off and was paralyzed from that moment on. That is a specific moment that we cannot replicate. We can't make it happen again. We can't just ask people to sign up to do something like that. So the reason why case studies are so valuable is for a number of reasons. We can observe the behavior if, if it was filmed. We can also get psychological examinations on the person. We can also do interviews and medical records. So we're going to talk about a case uh, a little bit later called Phineas Gage. And the reason why Phineas Gage is such an important case is, you know, he survived this unbelievable incident. Survival is key. If you don't have survival, then what's the point? Uh, we, we can point to stuff beforehand that occurred, but we can't actually ask the person what happened. So what are the strengths? It's non-replicable. All right, and that's um, that's really important. That's a kind of it's a super unique moment that happened to one person or a group of people. We'll talk about a psychological case um, involving uh, 9/11. You 9/11 is somewhat of a case study, even though there's been other terroristic moments that have happened in this country and other countries around the world. 9/11 is extremely specific, and we'll talk about that one later. What is the weakness? Observer bias is always going to come into play. And we cannot replicate it. So how can replication be a strength and a weak weakness? Well, if you are a psychologist that studies case studies specifically, that's the joy of it, is what is the new thing that is occurring? Or what is this very, very bizarre incident that happened? And that fires people up in order to do a lot more research into the human mind and brain. And the reason why it's a weakness is because a lot of times you want a lot of data on a lot of information. So if I'm studying elephants, you know, I can do African elephants, I can do Asian elephants, you know, I could do elephants from this area and elephants from this age and um, all the different things that occur when it, in, in, in naturalistic observation, but replication is going to be very, very difficult. So two of the more famous case studies are about Phineas Gage. You see the diagram on the bottom right. Phineas Gage had a metal rod go right through his frontal lobe. If you're, in, if you're familiar with what the frontal lobe does, frontal lobe is, all, uh, is predominantly about uh, how we grow as a person and major decisions and also emotion center of the brain. The frontal lobe of teenagers is not fully developed. That's why things are much more emotional when we're teens than it is in, to our 30s, 40s, 50s, and beyond. Um, so him surviving that metal rod going through his brain after an explosion on a railroad track is unbelievable. We'll, we'll dive into him uh, a little bit more. Jeannie, also known as the feral child or the wild child, was locked up in her room for 14 years of her life um, in Los Angeles. We'll see a video clip about the discovery of Jean, Jeannie and why she is considered a feral child. The Lost Children of Rockdale County, somewhat of more of a recent case study. Um, Phineas Gage is Early 18, or sorry, uh, late 1800s. Genie was in the 1970s. This was in the 1990s. This is a case study of a syphilis e uh, epidemic at a high school in an affluent suburb of Atlanta, just like many of the suburbs here in Indianapolis. Why this is extremely rare to have this many syphilis cases in a school like Rockdale County's area. Um, so we'll dive into that as well. All right, what about a survey? A survey, uh, you've taken surveys all the time. You take, you do Twitter polls, you do surveys for school on Google Forms. One of the great things about surveys or what we call questionnaires is it, it's going to be able to give you a lot of information in a quick amount of time. So the strengths is you can get a lot of information at a fairly low cost. You will conduct a survey experiment twice in this class. Um, you'll do it once uh, during this unit and you'll also do it once 
in another unit uh, in the second semester. The If you randomly sample people, which is tough to do in a school environment, you can generalize your findings to the population. So since we are a school of 14 to 18 year olds, we can make some generalizations about 14 to 18 year olds as long as we get a large random sample. If you only choose your friends, well, that's not random sampling. If you only choose the football team, that's not random sampling. If you only choose the theater department, that's not random sampling. Random sampling is legitimately random, where you are walking up to them in the middle of the hallway or you send it out to 100 random people, and, and that's um, the way you kind of get a randomness of it. What is the weakness? Wording effect. We'll talk about wording effect, and I'll show you a video about wording effect. The way things are worded, especially in political polls and surveys, uh, can change the results massively. And, you know, you got the example, should sh cigarette ads be allowed on television? Should cigarette ads be forbid on television? Allowed and forbid are two words that are pretty much opposite, but forbid kind of has a little bit more of a punch to it. Then you got the social desirability effect. If directly asked about a sensitive subject, we may alter our answer to, to what we think is socially acceptable. Um, when sensitive questions are surveyed, if we are anonymous, people are a little bit more honest. But if, we, if our name is attached to it, then it becomes much more difficult. All right. That's where we're going to pause for now. I will hopefully see you guys very soon. Um, and hopefully this was uh, a decent um, lecture, and hope to see you guys uh, pretty soon.